Hi everyone and welcome to week 3. Before we get started, let's just do a quick recap of last week. Last week we touched upon quite a few concepts um, relating back to just the framework um, or different frameworks for crime prevention. We touched upon the preventive turn and the idea of homo prudence, rational man, and the abandonment of welfareist approaches. So this was in the context of talking about the uh, classical liberal philosophy uh, and its legacy on how we interpret crime and crime prevention. And then we talked about uh, situational prevention, community safety, and social or developmental prevention. We raised the question or, or posed the sort of opposition between administrative and critical approaches, but also, you know, suggested that, well, you know, this distinction uh, may not be uh, that useful because they both treat crime prevention, sorry, as an instrumental exercise. Then we had a bit of a discussion about the routine activities models. Uh, now you'll remember that these were sort of triangle shapes. Um, and we talked about also modifications to that model that took into account the more distal factors, the distant social courses, whereas the original model uh, talked about proximate factors, that is the immediate factors uh, in the event of crime. And then we also mentioned that there are, or there should be, problem-solving aspects to crime prevention, that uh, crime prevention uh, should be situation and context sensitive, that means aware of the unique features of the problem at hand and its location. Uh, it needs to be informed through a sort of feedback loop or a response loop of evaluation that assesses how effective the implementation has been, and that crime prevention uh, needs to be iterative, which means, you know, there are sort of several versions of a program. So the information uh, coming from feedback and evaluation sort of goes back to adjust the program or maybe we abandon the program or start over and so on. Now this week we're going to talk about um, fear and crime prevention. And what I want to cover in this lecture um, is the relevance of emotions and affects, right, when thinking about crime and prevention. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the cultural politics of fear, which is some work by a scholar you may or may not know called Sarah Ahmed, and then we'll delve a bit more into this week's reading and talk about the biopolitics of the fear of crime and the fear of crime feedback loop. Now, some of you may not be familiar with this term, affect, and when we're using it to talk about fear and emotions, we're talking about affect as a noun or a thing, um, as opposed to a verb or a doing word. So, an affect can be a thing, or one thing can affect another thing. It's really, really important that you do not confuse this word with effects, which is a very different thing altogether, okay? Now, you know, affect is sometimes equivocated with uh, emotion or feeling, but it kind of touches upon, you know, a little bit more than just feelings or emotions. Now, we may think of affects as embodied experiential states, Another sort of uh, definition is that affects are pre-personal intensities or states, bodily responses, that can be subsequently interpreted as personal feelings 
or socially constructed emotions, right? So what this is getting at is that affects are more than just feelings or thoughts, but it's actually a very embodied experience. It's how we, our entire body sort of responds to something, right? I mean, you know, it's the difference between, you know, sort of thinking about something and sort of just having an angry thought and, like, feeling it through your whole body. Maybe you're shaking or you're feeling a bit warm or something like that. So... When we use this phrase pre-personal intensity or state, it's saying that affect is a little bit different from feelings or emotions in that feelings uh, sort of exist on the individual personal level once we've kind of interpreted an affect. And emotions are sort of socially constructed in that, you know, sometimes you may... Uh, ask your friend or make a comment, you know, I don't know how I'm supposed to feel about that when you've had a very strange or new situation. And that's touching upon the socially constructed nature of emotions that, uh, you know, how we sort of feel and respond to certain things is informed by existing sort of social and cultural values and practices. Now, on that note, Affect is more than just, you know, emotional feeling, but it also helps us, uh, well, you know, as Cameron Duff sort of notes, affect also refers to a potential for action and an orientation toward the world, right? Uh, we become affected by something, and then as a result, we sort of view the world in a particular way, or we get ready to do something uh, so, as a result, we can think of affects as the product of encounters with and in the world, right? They don't just pop out of nowhere. They are the result of our interactions with the material world around us. And another important point is that affects shape our agency. Now, remember, when we talk about agency, that's referring to our ability to act in the world, right? So, for example sorrow might dampen, diminish, or restrict one's power to act. You know, sometimes you may feel so, you know, overwhelmed with sadness about a particular thing that you, and you just don't have the ability at that point in time, as you're being sort of affected, um, to act in the world or, you know, achieve particular goals or things you want to do. So in that way, we can legitimately talk about affects as shaping our agency. Now, if this is getting a little bit too sort of theoretical and abstract for you, it's okay for the purpose of understanding the material in this lecture that you sort of think of affects as emotions, okay? But they're a little bit more than that, but it's enough. You can get by just thinking about them as emotions. Just keep in mind um, some of the things that we mentioned on um, these previous slides about affect. And now moving on to the work of Sarah Ahmed, who's uh, written about a lot of stuff, but in this case we're talking about the cultural politics of fear. And it's important to realize that fear doesn't just describe a feeling. It's not just a name or a label. But as we sort of touched upon when discussing affect, fear as a feeling does things. Okay. Now, some of the things that it does is that it helps to establish distance between bodies. Right. Now, a more a less abstract way of of talking about that is it helps to re-establish the apartness of self and other. If we fear something other than ourselves, that feeling of fear helps to remind us of our difference and separation from the thing we fear. And so, um, because, um, you know, this sort of feared other is really, a, you know, a very specific thing, uh, we use uh, social stereotypes to try and pin down the precise meanings uh, of the other. Um, 
but you know that the fact that we need these stereotypes to pin down the meaning means that you know the fear to others is, is actually a bit more abstract uh, than it would seem. Now, another thing uh, to note based on what Ahmed is saying is that different bodies will feel fear differently. Now, this sort of at face value seems pretty obvious and straightforward, but she's also making the point that, um, you know, the same kinds of fears, um, you know, are experienced and felt differently based on people's sort of different social positions and, you know, socioeconomic status and so on. And it depends on whether, you know, uh, your sort of fall broadly within the norms of society or whether you fit outside those norms and so on. And so this is what Ahmed means when she's saying the effect of fear is shaped by one's relationship with space and mobility. Um, where you are socially and in social space sort of determines um, the capacity for fear to shape your experience and your agency. Now, another important thing that stems from this is that also the fear of crime is not necessarily correlated with the objective risk of becoming a victim of crime. As uh, Ditton and Farrell sort of have argued, those in least danger are often uh, the most afraid. So what we can take away from this is that fear is not just the result of some objective threat. It's not a, um, a purely rational response, um, you know, linking back to uh, last week and the week before, I think, talking about the... Uh, legacy of classical liberal philosophy and the idea of rational man. Fear is this sort of socially situated, socially specific thing. Now, um, let's have a think about the relationship between fear and embodiment. So this may seem a little bit abstract, but bear with me, because this feeds into the next section of the lecture. Now, um, fear shapes a body's relationship with the world, right? And what that means is that our sort of exposure to the world, our openness to the world, becomes, starts to be sensed, right, as a danger. And now, when we talk about danger... Danger is anticipated as future pain or injury, right? So when we fear something, we sense that, you know, our exposure to the world or in put in more sort of concrete practical terms, maybe being in, you know, a shady neighborhood or something like that, our um, exposure to the world, our openness to the world um, becomes sensed as a source of danger. So we're in that shady neighbourhood, we're walking around, and we're thinking, oh gee, something's about to happen, something might happen in the immediate future, right? So it's anticipating future harm, future pain or injury, right? Now in this way, Ahmed argues that fear shapes, in a way, the contact between the body and the world. The body um, so to speak, shrinks back from the world to avoid fear. And I, I think, you know, this actually isn't too abstract a thing to say. You can kind of almost sense it when you feel scared. Um, you know, you may sort of literally, you know, sort of, sort of condense yourself a little bit more. You try and pull away to avoid um, fear. Now, in that sense, this... Um, metaphorical shrinking, um, this uh, metaphorical shrinking um, in turn restricts one's mobility as the body prepares for flight. Now this can be sort of quite literal, you know, being frozen on the spot. 
or it could be a little bit more abstract and saying that, well, the range of activities and, and things that you might do is restrained by the effect of uh, fear. Now, in this way, fear as an emotion aligns bodily space with social space. So in that way, the sort of emotional response you're having to the social space around you sort of helps you ad adjust yourself to that. Now, importantly, the fear response, again, as we said, it's not this purely objective, uh, rational process. The fear response is also influenced by existing social discourses about who or what is to be feared, right? So, you know, depending on who the folk devil is of the day, you may or may not be afraid of some particular other person, you know, some other body walking down the street. Now, coming back to this week's reading, um, we're talking about this idea of governing the fearful and inventing the feared, right? Now, what Lee is arguing is that the fear of crime as a, you know, as a particular phenomenon um, emerged from the overlap of several contemporary late modern discourses, governmental discourses, disciplinary discourses, political discourses, right? Now, you don't need to lose too much sleep about these different discourses if you've only just heard about them, right? It's just making the point that the fear of crime emerged alongside these things. And these discourses are related to ideas around neoliberalism, responsabilization. Now, those two things, neoliberalism and responsabilization, we've already mentioned um, in previous lectures, and also the risk society. Now, you may have come across that, um, the work of Ulrich Beck, basically, uh, and I'm simplifying a bit here, but the idea that um, our day-to-day -day lives are structured through or around ideas about risk and the management of risk and that this is this was not always the case and this is a relatively modern phenomenon um, so as a result we can make the claim that the fear of crime is a product of late modernity now we're not saying that you know people weren't uh, ever afraid of being uh, murdered or, you know, having their things stolen. But we're talking about fear of crime in a very particular way. Let's just say that the contemporary view of the fear of crime is a product of late modernity. Now, the interesting thing about um, the fear of crime is that it, it turns out it's both... Um, something to be understood, right, an object of study, and an administrative project in itself. Now, we'll come back to that, um, but just keep that in mind for now. Now, um, empirical research, right, social uh, study and inquiry and so on, um, produced crime-preventing rationalities, right? that suppose or assume this particular governable fearing subject, right? Now, in other words, um, you know, research about crime and the fear of crime gave us a little bit more understanding that we could hypothesize there's this type of person who is the fearing subject, the person who is afraid of crime. Now, this fearing subject, the person who is afraid, is the sort of imagined or assumed target of certain governmental policies, as well as social research, right? Um, 
and particular strategies or techniques of governance try to govern or shape the conduct of fearing subjects, which is really just a complicated way of saying that um, you know governments try to uh, reduce the fear of crime, and one of the ways that they do this is by actually sort of shaping uh, the behavior of those who fear crime, right? So uh, these tactics uh, are informed by governmental rationalities, right? But these rationalities are shaped by social inquiry. And now when we think about the fear of crime as governance, it's saying that, well, you know, reducing the fear of crime seems a bit difficult. Um, as has sort of been mentioned before, the public seems as fearful as ever of crime, despite dramatic falls in some types of offence categories in Western countries, right? So another way of thinking about that is, well, we seem to be actually safer than we were previously, but we're more afraid, right? And one of the points that this week's reading is making is that the more we try to govern fear, right, the more strategies and techniques we use to manage this fear of crime, it sort of seems like the more fearful we actually become. So in this way, and this is sort of linking back to what was said about the fear of crime as an object as well as um, an administrative project in itself, the fear of crime is not just an object or a problem of governance, which is another way of saying that the fear of crime is not just something that needs to be controlled and managed, but the fear of crime is itself a tactic or a strategy of governance, right? The fear of crime can be used to manage and control the behaviours of society broadly. Right, So the fear of crime often gets invoked to encourage individuals to manage their own risks. Okay, So in this way, the threat or the perceived threat of crime uh, encourages people to actually take action and do things that minimize their risk of being affected by crime, right? So in this way, we can say that the risk of victimization, right, the risk of being um, affected by crime, is governed at a distance through the fear of crime, right? So the government doesn't, the state doesn't directly intervene or coerce you to do one thing or the other, but relies, right, on this fear of victimization, on this fear of crime, to do the work for them, so to speak, and encourage citizens to take measures into their own hands and protect themselves, basically. Now, of course, we talk about the fear of crime, well, you know, fear presupposes an object of fear, something to be afraid of. And crime is a pretty sort of vague and broad topic. Now, Garland um, describes two broad criminological tendencies to help us sort of think about this fear of crime. And that's a criminology of the self and a criminology of the other. Now, that's just referring to two broad tendencies, right, rather than specific theories or anything like that. Now, a criminology of the self approach... Uh, works to routinize crime, which means that, you know, offenders are presented as rational people just like us, and that there are certain factors in place that uh, motivate them to commit crime. But then we have the criminology of the other, which uh, works to demonize criminals. It sort of presents them as these threatening outcasts, these fearsome strangers, right? And you'll sort of get a lot of this from what you might call the folk criminology of a current affair in Today Tonight and Talk Back um, Shock Jock Radio, right? Talking about offenders as, you know, inhuman, uh, you know, monstrous figures. And we talked about the fearing subject earlier on. Well, the criminology of the other constructs the feared subject, right? The thing that we are afraid of.
So, um, you know, moving on from that, we see how the fear of crime itself becomes as important an object of governance as crime, right? So we're trying to manage both crime and the fear of crime. And um, now, let's have a think about the governmentality of fear, right? Another method of governing the fear of crime is through locally targeted prevention, right? So in this way, crime prevention, you know, coming back to the, you know, name of the course, crime prevention also functions as a fear reduction strategy, right? Governing the fear of crime increasingly happens at the local level in conjunction with other local and community agencies. You'll recall that this was mentioned in the previous uh, two weeks uh, of lectures. And now, of course, these um, uh, governance strategies are usually centrally coordinated by the state. And this is under a rationality of managerialism, which also we uh, mentioned last week. Now, in this way, uh, the government and its agencies, you know, formulate and organize techniques, methods, and, you know, stated goals and outcomes when it comes to governing the fear of crime. But the fear of crime itself is governed at a distance, you know, it's governed locally. And this is, again, linking back to the um, uh, ideas around responsabilization and what was being said in previous slides about, um, you know, managing the population's behavior from afar by relying on um, their own sort of, you know, fears and rationalities and so on. Now, in some circumstances, governments and policymakers actually, you know, see a certain level of fear as desirable or useful to ensure that citizens govern their own safety, you know, governing from afar, responsabilization. So in this way, we can say that fear becomes a governing tactic of risk reduction, right? So using the fear of crime as a strategy to govern, that is, manage, risk reduction. So this um, speaks to a dilemma, you know, of governing or managing the fear of crime. And this dilemma results from the fact that fear itself has a certain usefulness as a tactic of governing people, okay? So this is coming back to that sort of circular thing I mentioned earlier, that we try to manage the fear of crime, but we can also use the fear of crime to manage people. Now, in this way, we can actually start talking about the biopolitics of the fear of crime. Now, you'll sort of recall um, biopolitics uh, coming from the work of Foucault. Um, don't lose too much sleep over it if you're not that familiar with it. It sort of just means, or it refers to um, broadly managing the lives of a population rather than individuals. Now, if we talk about the fear of crime as a biopolitical strategy, we're talking about um, the population governing themselves as a governing tactic in itself. Now, that sounds a bit confusing, but another way of thinking about that is the state training citizens to manage their own affairs in line with the ideals and goals of the state. So training citizens to manage themselves or encouraging and facilitating citizens to manage themselves becomes itself the way that the state governs its population. So 
That's what we mean when we say governing from a distance. Now, more specifically to the fear of crime, people become sensitized or aware of this fear of crime through what we might call governmental instruction or advice. Now, this is where talking about biopolitics and governmentality gets a bit confusing, because in this case, when we say governmental, it doesn't just mean, you know, reports and things from the elected government. But when we say governmental, it refers to the whole range of practices and things that try to modify our behavior uh, in particular ways. So this isn't just the elected government or state agencies, but this can include self-help books, um, the discourse from friends. It can include marketing and advertising material. Anything that you come across that tries to, you know, modify your behavior, uh, which is sort of, you know, I mean, it can be just things that try to suggest you to do one thing rather than the other, okay? So people become sensitized through fear, or to the fear of crime, sorry, through a range of governmental instructions and advice. And through this um, discourse, this collection of instruction and advice, we then become expected to manage our own bodies and property against the risk of crime or harm from feared others. Now, um, as a result, the fearing subject is a responsibilized and active citizen. In a way, it becomes their civic duty to keep themselves and their property safe, right? So this is the governing at a distance by making citizens take on the burden of responsibility themselves that we then manage uh, the population with regard to uh, crime prevention. Responsabilization, therefore, minimizes active or coercive state intervention. But as hopefully I've made clear over the past few slides, it is still intervention. Our behaviors are still modified, you know, in some cases more, in some cases less, but they are modified to suit particular rationalities or outcomes. For example, while there are no uh, legal restrictions on an individual's movements, um, the fearing subject will be expected to uh, curfew themselves. One example of this is uh, maybe tone-deaf political and community leaders telling women not to walk alone at night so that they don't get assaulted. Now, of course, that's, um, again, victim-blaming territory, but... This is kind of the underlying rationality that there are no explicit um, restrictions, but it is expected that the citizen, as a matter of their own civic duty, uh, keep themselves and their own property safe. One last thing to mention is this idea of the fear of crime uh, feedback loop. Now, one point to make is that crime fear and prevention discourses tend to imagine uh, or address the type of fearing subject who is least likely to require regulation um, or able to afford risk avoidance products. And this links back to what was being said last week and the week before about how some of the most socially marginalized and disadvantaged people are at the most risk of, you know, property and violent crime, um, but they are also the least uh, capable of enacting or affording particular prevention strategies. As HOPE uh, 2000 notes, 
Uh, economically disadvantaged people are more at risk of violent offending, but in no position to join the security club. And we can then think back to how you know, some of the people who are least likely to be victimised seem to be uh, the most fearful of crime. So we talk about this broad um, discourse of the fear of crime. Uh, it adds to the sort of general and diffuse fear of crime throughout society. And this uh, functions as a feedback loop. And this comes back to the point I sort of made at the beginning uh, of the lecture, which is that the more we try to govern or manage the fear of crime, the more this process feeds back into the actual fear of crime. And this fear of crime then works to govern us. So that's what we're getting at when we talk about a fear of crime feedback loop. We try to manage and intervene in the fear of crime, and then it just feeds back into the fear of crime itself, and this also functions as a strategy or tactic of governance. So having gone through all of these points today, we've covered a lot of material again in a short uh, period of time. So let's have a think about, um, you know, what's the take-home message today? Here are a few points you might want to keep in mind as you revise and prepare for next week and so on. And that is that fear as an affect, right, as an emotional thing, is important in understanding crime prevention rationalities. Fear also has this dual function, right? The fear of crime can be managed through crime prevention practices. On the other hand, the fear of crime can also be used to manage crime prevention practices. So this is, again, that sort of feedback loop idea. The fear of crime functions as a biopolitical strategy, which means citizens govern themselves by taking on governmental discourses about crime prevention. The responsibilized citizen takes on the management of their own risk as a civic duty. This is governing from afar. And as I've already mentioned, the fear of crime functions as a feedback loop. The more we try to manage the fear of crime, the more we seem to be affected by the fear of crime. Now, thinking about next week, week four, we're going to get into more specific territory. We're going to, going to be talking about models of crime prevention, and in particular, social and community crime prevention. So the reading for next week is going to be Sutton, Cherney and White, Chapter 3, Social Prevention. Now, some things to think about as you prepare for next week and as you're doing the reading. One where might social prevention fit in with this week's ideas around fear? Two, where might social prevention fit in with regard to week two's typologies and frameworks, right? We were talking about administrative and critical approaches and so on. And three, what do you think social prevention, um, sorry, do you think social prevention relates more closely to Felsen's crime triangle or X crime triangle, right? And something you might want to also think about is just, you know, in, is there any scope for thinking about social prevention in terms of responsibilization, governmentality, um, and biopolitical strategy? Okay, all the best, good luck for next week, and I'll see you then.